The public is endlessly fascinated with murder. When it's on the news, we may recoil in shock and horror, but often we are curious to find out more. Leatherface is the most recurring villain of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre series. He is one of the biggest horror icons, but unlike most of them, is not supernatural in any way. His main weapons are a chainsaw and sledgehammer. He does not talk that much, though he does make vocal sounds. He wears a mask made from a person's skin, which is used to express a personality. The character of Leatherface and minor plot details were inspired by the crimes of real-life murderer Ed Gein. The purpose of this video is to provide information on Ed Gein. It's in no way to serve as a tribute to this man or his terrible deeds. Edward Theodore Gein was born to Augusta Crafter and George P. Gein on August 27, 1906 in Wisconsin. His parents, both natives of Wisconsin, had married on July 7, 1900. Their marriage produced Ed and his older brother, Henry G. Gein. George Gein was a violent alcoholic who was frequently unemployed. Ed and his brother rejected their violent, aimless father, as did Augusta, who treated her husband like a non-entity. Despite her deep contempt for her husband, the troubled marriage persisted. Divorce was not an option due to the family's religious beliefs. Augusta operated the small family grocery store and eventually purchased a farm on the outskirts of another small town, Plainfield, which became the Gein family's permanent home. Augusta moved to this desolate location to prevent outsiders from influencing her sons. Gein only left the premises to go to school, and Augusta blocked any attempt he made to pursue friendships. Besides school, he spent most of his time doing chores on the farm. Augusta drummed into her boys the innate immorality of the world, the evil of drink and the belief that all women, herself excluded, were prostitutes. According to Augusta, the only acceptable form of sex was for biological reproduction. She reserved time every afternoon to read to them from the Bible, usually selecting graphic verses from the Old Testament dealing with death, murder, and divine retribution. With a slight growth over one eye and an effeminate demeanor, the young Gein became a target for bullies. Classmates and teachers recall other off-putting mannerisms such as seemingly random laughter. Despite his poor social development, he did fairly well in school, particularly in reading and the study of world economics. By the time his father George died in 1940, Henry had begun to reject Augusta's view of the world. He'd even taken to bad-mouthing her within earshot of his mortified brother. In March 1944, the brothers found themselves in the middle of a brush fire on property they owned in a neighboring county. When Ed ran to get the police, he told them he'd lost sight of Henry, but then led them directly to his brother's corpse. Although there was evidence Henry had suffered blunt trauma to his head, the local county coroner decided he died of asphyxiation while fighting the fire. Gein then lived with his mother. Less than two years later, on December 29, 1945, Augusta died from a series of strokes, leaving her grief-stricken son alone on the isolated farmstead. When she died, her son was a 39-year-old bachelor, still emotionally enslaved to the woman who'd ruled his life. The house soon generated into a madman shambles. Thanks to federal subsidies, Guy no longer needed to farm his land, and he abandoned it to do odd jobs here and there for the Plainfield residents, to earn him a little extra cash, but he remained alone in the enormous farmhouse, haunted by the ghost of his overbearing mother, whose bedroom he kept locked and undisturbed exactly as it had been when she was alive. He also sealed off the drawing room and five more upstairs rooms, living only in the one downstairs room and the kitchen. Weird Old Eddie, as the local community know him, had begun to develop a deeply unhealthy interest in the intimate anatomy of the female body, an interest that was fed by medical encyclopedias, books on anatomy, and pulp horror novels. He became particularly interested in the atrocities committed by the Nazis during the Second World War, and the medical experiments performed on Jews in the concentration camps. Soon he began digging up female corpses by night in far-flung Wisconsin cemeteries. These he would dissect and keep some of the body parts. Not surprisingly, he quickly became a recluse in the community, discouraging any visitors from coming near his now-neglected and decaying farm. Gein's fascination with the female body eventually led him to seek out fresher samples, his victims, usually women of his mother's age, included 54-year-old Mary Hogan, who disappeared from the tavern she ran in December 1954. Police suspected Gein to be involved in the disappearance of a store clerk, Bernice Warden, in Plainfield on November 16th, 1957. Upon entering a shed on his property, they made their first horrific discovery of the night. Warden's corpse. She had been decapitated. Her headless body hung upside down by means of ropes at her waist and a crossbar at her ankles. 
she had been shot at close range. Searching the house, authorities found the following. Human skulls mounted upon the corner post of his bed. Human skin fashioned into a lampshade and used to upholster chair seats. Human skull caps apparently in use as soup bowls. A human heart. The head of Mary Hogan found in a paper bag. A ceiling like pool consisting of human lips and much more. Gein's most notorious creations were an array of shrunken heads. Various neighborhood children whom Gein occasionally babysat had seen or heard of these objects, which Gein offhandedly described as relics from the South Sea, purportedly sent by a cousin who had served in World War II. Upon investigation, these turned out to be human facial skins, carefully peeled from cadavers and used by Gein as masks. Gein eventually admitted under questioning that he would dig up the graves of recently buried middle-aged women he thought resembled his mother and take the bodies home. One writer describes Gein's practice of putting on tanned skins of women as an insane transvestite ritual. Shortly after his mother's death, Gein decided he wanted a sex change. Although it's a matter of some debate whether or not he was a transsexual, by most accounts he created his woman's suit so he could pretend to be his mother, rather than change his sex. Gein was found mentally incompetent and thus unfit to stand trial at the time of his arrest, and was sent to the Central State Hospital in Wisconsin. Later, Central State Hospital was converted into a prison, and Gein was transferred to Mendota State Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin. In 1968, Gein's doctor determined he was sane enough to stand trial. He was found not guilty by reasons of insanity, and spent the rest of his life in the hospital. While Gein was in detention, his house burned to the ground. Arson was suspected. In 1958, Gein's car, which was used to haul the bodies of his victims, was sold at public auction for a then considerable sum of $760. It was sold to a carnival operator named Bunny Gibbons. Gibbons called his attraction the Ed Gein Gore Car, and charged carnival goers 25 cents admission to see it. On July 26, 1984, Ed Gein died of heart failure due to cancer in Goodland Hall at the Mendota Mental Health Institute. His gravesite in Plainfield Cemetery was frequently vandalized over the years. Souvenir seekers would chip off pieces of his gravestone before the bulk of it was stolen in 2000. The gravestone was recovered in June 2001 near Seattle and is presently kept in storage. <laughs>